Okay, so here's the applications. Restoration, conservation, and preservation. By the way, these three, I, I had with me last night that, that big, thick anthology of articles on uh, environmental ethics. And in the introduction, uh, the editors say that they have begun with theory, but then they look at the three aspects of uh, relationship to the environment, conservation, preservation, and restoration. It's not just me that made up these categories. This is pretty standard fare. But it seems to me that, that this theocentric ethic that we've been describing, rooted in a theology of creation and understanding the place of humanity in creation, can help us understand these three in a very profound way. First, restoration. There are landfills that need to be cleaned up. There's trash that must be picked up. Um, this stuff out there, if left in place, is going to wind up causing health problems for people. Things are thrown in landfills that ultimately percolate through the, uh, through the ground as rain and, and, and so on, and wind up in the water table. You probably have all seen reports on the news or on 20, 20 year shows like that about the fact that every one of us, when we drink water, are drinking prescription drugs that people have flushed down the toilet. It's incredibly difficult for a, a water company uh, uh, to, to filter out some of these chemicals uh, drug came and, and that gets into the water supply and it pollutes us. When we lived in Colorado, up in the mountains there, we had, a, we had a well. It was 268 feet deep and the water that came out of that was so sweet and pure and cold. It was, it was just wonderful. And then one spring, uh, my wife and I and our daughter who was living with us at the time, we all got sick and we thought we had the flu. And I began to notice that, I, I, you know, my beard's curly and I tend to get ingrown hairs on my neck, but they were getting infected. And then I started getting inf you know, infected pimples and, and this was weird, you know, so I started using more soap and everybody was getting sick. And one day in the shower, it occurred to me, maybe something's wrong with our water. So I took a sample of water down to the Boulder Health Department and they tested it. And it tested positive for fecal coliform, you know, the bacteria that's in feces. Well, how did that get in my well down there, 268 feet below the ground? What do I do about that? Well, you know, what you do is charge the well with chlorine. You give it shock treatment with chlorine, rinse it out, you know, it's a, it's a process, takes a day or so. Flush the house, all the pipes. That worked fine for about two weeks. Then we started getting sick again. Take another, yep, fecal coliform again. So I go through the chlorine charging process a second time. This time we didn't drink the water uh, before I got it tested. It was back. And I thought, how did this get in my well? Well, somebody had built a house about a quarter of a mile away, and they, they dynamited the bedrock to, to get down so they could put a cistern in. And I thought, I'll bet that's what did it. I'll bet, I'll bet their septic field is draining into my well. It's fractured the granite. So I went down and I had it tested to see if it was human fecal coliform, and it wasn't. So it wasn't coming from my neighbor. I, I wanted him to pay for my well to get fixed, but I, <laughs> but I couldn't. So finally, we, we had to spend about $3,000 to put in a purification system in our basement. The well got polluted. I don't know where the pollution was coming from. Never found it. But I wouldn't have thought that a well 268 feet down in granite would get polluted. Things like that lead to pollution of the water. And in the poorer countries,
where they don't have health departments that regularly test the water. They're the ones that are going to suffer the most for it. Restoration says we need to take corrective action. Restoration means providing malaria, uh, providing mosquito nets in malaria areas. Probably the most cost effective thing we can do to save the lives of children. Restoration means testing vaccines and providing affordable inoculations for the poor around the world so they don't die of easily preventable diseases. Restoration can mean building the aqueduct so we can irrigate arid land, make the deserts fertile, feed the population. This is Tokyo. Restoration means recognizing that although we can't prevent earthquakes, we can do the engineering and write the building codes so that survival is a lot more likely. And as you know, uh, in Tokyo, which certainly felt the shaking and the swaying, the rocking and rolling, uh, not a single window was broken, as I understand, even though you probably saw, as I did those videos taken out a window, and you could see the skyscrapers moving back and forth. The building codes, this is part of our work of restoration. What we can't prevent, we can engineer, plan for, and mitigate. Okay. There's much in this world that needs restoring. Moral and natural evils deface God's creation and bring suffering to his image bearers. Nature, and I put that in quotes, is not always benevolent. It seems to me that this notion of restoration is sufficient to underwrite the legitimacy of engineering technology, uh, public health. And if there are people in your church or some of you are in these fields or want to go into these fields, we ought to tell people like that, may your tribe increase. God bless you. You're doing the royal and priestly work of restoration. You're serving God. Romans 8 has a very difficult to understand passage. Creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected. I take it this refers to the fall and the curse on the ground, the curse on creation as a result of the fall. And God cursed it. He's the one who subjected it in the hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That is, the glorious freedom of the children of God is at the resurrection, and at that point with the new heavens and the new earth, the creation itself will be free from the second law of thermodynamics, be free from the tendency towards increasing entropy, be free from chaotic systems being disturbed and going chaotic. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, I don't think that what this is saying is don't do anything. You've got to wait for the new heavens and new earth. I think it's acknowledging the fact that creation is not now what it will be in the same way that we are not now what we will be. But we try, strive through the process of sanctification to attain the full measure of the fullness of Christ. And as we're able, we ought to strive for the same thing for creation. Isaiah 65, the Lord says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered. Remember, new heavens and a new earth, not just heaven. 
Revelation 21, I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first had passed away, and the sea was no more. God's program includes creation. It doesn't end with angels on clouds strumming harps. Okay. Saint Athanasius, that great hero of the faith, said, we will begin then with the creation of the world and with God as its maker. For the first fact that you must grasp is this. The renewal of creation has been wrought by the selfsame word who made it in the beginning. There is thus no inconsistency between creation and salvation. For the one Father has employed the same agent for both works, effecting the salvation of the world through the same word who made it at first. This is commentary in this passage in Romans. Just as Christ brings salvation and restoration to human beings, so he will bring restoration, salvation in a sense, redemption to creation. Historians have noted that the Eastern Church, with all of its oddities and odd theology, has retained this notion more than the Western Church has. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.